On the Divide by Willa Cather. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Divide by Willa Cather. Near Rattlesnake Creek, on the side of a little draw, stood Canute's shanty. North, east, south stretched the level Nebraska plain of long, rust-red grass that undulated constantly in the wind. To the west the ground was broken and rough, and a narrow strip of timber wound along the turbid, muddy little stream that had scarcely ambition enough to crawl over its black bottom. If it had not been for the few stunted cottonwoods and elms that grew along its banks, Canute would have shot himself years ago. The Norwegians are a timber-loving people, and if there is even a turtle pond with a few plum bushes around it, they seem irresistibly drawn toward it. As to the shanty itself, Canute had built it without aid of any kind, for when he first squatted along the banks of Rattlesnake Creek there was not a human being within twenty miles. It was built of logs split in halves, the chinks stopped with mud and plaster. The roof was covered with earth and was supported by one gigantic beam curved in the shape of a round arch. It was almost impossible that any tree had ever grown in that shape. The Norwegians used to say that Canute had taken the log across his knee and bent it into the shape he wished. There were two rooms. Or rather, there was one room with a partition made of ash saplings interwoven and bound together like big straw basket work. In one corner there was a cook stove, rusted and broken. In the other, a bed made of unplaned planks and poles. It was fully eight feet long, and upon it was a heap of dark bedclothing. There was a chair and a bench of colossal proportions. There was an ordinary kitchen cupboard with a few cracked, dirty dishes in it and beside it, on a tall box, a tin wash basin. Under the bed was a pile of pint flasks, some broken, some whole, all empty. On the wood box lay a pair of shoes of almost incredible dimensions. On the wall hung a saddle, a gun, and some ragged clothing, conspicuous among which was a suit of dark cloth, apparently new, with a paper collar carefully wrapped in a red silk handkerchief and pinned to the sleeve. Over the door hung a wolf and a badger skin, and on the door itself a brace of thirty or forty snakeskins whose noisy tails rattled ominously every time it opened. The strangest things in the shanty were the wide window sills. At first glance they looked as though they had been ruthlessly hacked and mutilated with a hatchet, but on closer inspection all the notches and holes in the wood took form and shape. There seemed to be a series of pictures. They were, in a rough way, artistic, but the figures were heavy and labored, as though they had been cut very slowly and with very awkward instruments. There were men plowing with little horned imps sitting on their shoulders and on their horses' heads. There were men praying with a skull hanging over their heads and little demons behind them mocking their attitudes. There were men fighting with big serpents and skeletons dancing together. All about these pictures were blooming vines and foliage such as never grew in this world, and coiled among the branches of the vines there was always the scaly body of a serpent, and behind every flower there was a serpent's head. It was a veritable dance of death by one who had felt its sting. In the wood box lay some boards, and every inch of them was cut up in the same manner. Sometimes the work was very rude and careless, and looked as though the hand of the workman had trembled. It would sometimes have been hard to distinguish the men from their evil geniuses but for one fact. The men were always grave, and were either toiling or praying, while the devils were always smiling and dancing. Several of these boards had been split for kindling, and it was evident that the artist did not value his work highly. It was the first day of winter on the Divide. Canute stumbled into his shanty carrying a basket of cobs, and after filling the stove, sat down on a stool and crouched his seven-foot frame over the fire, staring drearily out the window at the wide, gray sky. He knew by heart every individual clump of bunch grass in the miles of red shaggy prairie that stretched before his cabin. He knew it in all the deceitful loveliness of its early summer, and 
in all the bitter barrenness of its autumn. He had seen it smitten by all the plagues of Egypt. He had seen it parched by drought and sogged by rain, beaten by hail and swept by fire, and in the grasshopper years he had seen it eaten as bare and clean as bones that the vultures have left. After the great fires he had seen it stretch for miles and miles, black and smoking as the floor of hell. He rose slowly and crossed the room, dragging his big feet heavily as though they were burdens to him. He looked out of the window into the hog corral and saw the pigs burying themselves in the straw before the shed. The leaden gray clouds were beginning to spill themselves, and the snowflakes were settling down over the white, leprous patches of frozen earth where the hogs had gnawed even the sod away. He shuddered and began to walk, trampling heavily with his ungainly feet. He was the wreck of ten winters on the Divide, and he knew what that meant. Men fear the winters of the Divide as a child fears night, or as men in the North Seas fear the still, dark cold of the polar twilight. His eyes fell upon his gun, and he took it down from the wall and looked it over. He sat down on the edge of his bed and held the barrel towards his face, letting his forehead rest upon it, and laid his finger on the trigger. He was perfectly calm. There was neither passion nor despair in his face, but the thoughtful look of a man who is considering. Presently he laid down the gun and, reaching into the cupboard, drew out a pint bottle of raw white alcohol. Lifting it to his lips, he drank greedily. He washed his face in the tin basin and combed his rough hair and shaggy blonde beard. Then he stood in uncertainty before the suit of dark clothes that hung on the wall. For the fiftieth time he took them in his hands and tried to summon courage to put them on. He took the paper collar that was pinned to the sleeve of the coat and cautiously slipped it under his rough beard, looking with timid expectancy into the cracked, splashed glass that hung over the bench. With a short laugh he threw it down on the bed, and pulling on his old black hat he went out, striking off across the level. It was a physical necessity for him to get away from his cabin once in a while. He had been there for ten years, digging and plowing and sowing and reaping what little the hail and the hot winds and the frosts left him to reap. Insanity and suicide are very common things on the Divide. They come on like an epidemic in the hot wind season. Those scorching, dusty winds that blow up over the bluffs from Kansas seem to dry up the blood in men's veins as they do the sap in the corn leaves. Whenever the yellow scorch creeps down over the tender inside leaves about the ear, then the coroners prepare for active duty, for the oil of the country is burned out, and it does not take long for the flame to eat up the wick. It causes no great sensation there when a Dane is found swinging to his own windmill tower, and most of the Poles, after they have become too careless and discouraged to shave themselves, keep their razors to cut their throats with. It may be that the next generation on the Divide will be very happy, but the present one came too late in life. It's useless for men that have cut hemlocks among the mountains of Sweden for forty years to try to be happy in a country as flat and gray and naked as the sea. It's not easy for men that have spent their youth fishing in the northern seas to be content with following a plow, and men that have served in the Austrian army hate hard work and coarse clothing on the loneliness of the plains, and long for marches and excitement and tavern company and pretty barmaids. After a man has passed his fortieth birthday, it is not easy for him to change the habits and conditions of his life. Most men bring with them to the Divide only the dregs of the lives that they have squandered in other lands and among other peoples. Knut Knutsen was as mad as any of them, but his madness did not take the form of suicide or religion, but of alcohol. He had always taken liquor when he wanted it, as all Norwegians do, but after his first year of solitary life he settled down to it steadily. He exhausted whiskey after a while and went to alcohol because its effects were speedier and surer. He was a big man and with a terrible amount of resistant force, and it took a great deal of alcohol even to move him. After nine years of drinking, the quantities he could take would seem fabulous to an ordinary drinking man. He never let it interfere with his work. He generally drank at night and on Sundays, 
Every night, as soon as his chores were done, he began to drink. While he was able to sit up, he would play on his mouth harp or hack away at his window sills with his jackknife. When the liquor went to his head, he would lie down on his bed and stare out the window until he went to sleep. He drank alone and in solitude, not for pleasure or good cheer, but to forget the awful loneliness and level of the divide. Milton made a sad blunder when he put mountains in hell. Mountains postulate faith and aspiration. All mountain peoples are religious. It was the cities of the plains that, because of their utter lack of spirituality and the mad caprice of their vice, were cursed of God. Alcohol is perfectly consistent in its effects upon man. Drunkenness is merely an exaggeration. A foolish man drunk becomes maudlin. A bloody man, vicious. A coarse man, vulgar. Canute was none of these, but he was morose and gloomy, and liquor took him through all the hells of Dante. As he lay on his giant's bed, all the horrors of this world and every other were laid bare to his chilled senses. He was a man who knew no joy, a man who toiled in silence and bitterness. The skull and the serpent were always before him, the symbols of eternal feudalness and eternal hate. When the first Norwegians, near enough to be called neighbors, came, Canute rejoiced and planned to escape from his bosom vice. But he was not a social man by nature, and had not the power of drawing out the social side of other people. His new neighbors rather feared him because of his great strength and size, his silence and his lowering brows. Perhaps, too, they knew that he was mad, mad from the eternal treachery of the plains which every spring stretch green and rustle with the promises of Eden, showing long grassy lagoons full of clear water and cattle whose hooves are stained with wild roses. Before autumn the lagoons are dried up, and the ground is burnt dry and hard until it blisters and cracks open. So, instead of becoming a friend and neighbor to the men that settled about him, Canute became a mystery and a terror. They told awful stories of his size and strength and of the alcohol he drank. They said that one night, when he went out to see to his horses just before he went to bed, his steps were unsteady, and the rotten planks of the floor gave way and threw him behind the feet of a fiery young stallion. His foot was caught fast in the floor, and the nervous horse began kicking frantically. When Canute felt the blood trickling down into his eyes from a scalp wound on his head, he roused himself from his kingly indifference, and with the quiet, stoical courage of a drunken man, leaned forward and wound his arms around the horse's hind legs and held them against his breast with crushing embrace. All through the darkness and cold of the night he lay there, matching strength against strength. When little Jim Peterson went over the next morning at four o'clock to go with him to the blue to cut wood, he found him so, and the horse was on its foreknees, trembling and whinnying with fear. This is the story the Norwegians tell of him, and if it is true, it is no wonder that they feared and hated this holder of the heels of horses. One spring, there moved to the next eighty, a family that made a great change in Canute's life. Ole Jensen was too drunk most of the time to be afraid of anyone, and his wife Mary was too garrulous to be afraid of anyone who listened to her talk, and Lena, their pretty daughter, was not afraid of man nor devil. So it came about that Canute went over to take his alcohol with Ole oftener than he took it alone. After a while, the report spread that he was going to marry Jensen's daughter, and the Norwegian girls began to tease Lena about the great bear she was going to keep house for. No one could quite see how the affair had come about, for Canute's tactics of courtship were somewhat peculiar. He apparently never spoke to her at all. He would sit for hours with Mary chattering on one side of him and Ole drinking on the other and watch Lena at her work. She teased him and threw flour in his face and put vinegar in his coffee, but he took her rough jokes with silent wonder, never even smiling. He took her to church occasionally, but the most watchful and curious people never saw him speak to her. He would sit staring at her while she giggled and flirted with the other men. Next spring, Mary Lee went to town to work in a steam laundry. She came home every Sunday and always ran across to Jensen's to startle Lena with stories of ten-cent theaters, firemen's dances, and all the other aesthetic delights of metropolitan life. <laughs> 
In a few weeks Lena's head was completely turned, and she gave her father no rest until he let her go to town to seek her fortune at the ironing board. From the time she came home on her first visit, she began to treat Canute with contempt. She had bought a plush cloak and kid gloves, had her clothes made by the dressmaker, and assumed airs and graces that made the other women of the neighborhood cordially detest her. She generally brought with her a young man from town who waxed his mustache and wore a red necktie, and she did not even introduce him to Canute. The neighbors teased Canute a good deal until he knocked one of them down. He gave no sign of suffering from her neglect except that he drank more and avoided the other Norwegians more carefully than ever. He lay around in his den, and no one knew what he felt or thought. But little Jim Peterson, who had seen him glowering at Lena in church one Sunday when she was there with the town man, said that he would not give an acre of his wheat for Lena's life or the town chaps either. And Jim's wheat was so wondrously worthless that the statement was an exceedingly strong one. Canute had bought a new suit of clothes that looked as nearly like the town man as possible. They had cost him half a millet crop, for tailors are not accustomed to fitting giants, and they charge for it. He hung those clothes in his shanty two months ago and had never put them on, partly from fear of ridicule, partly from discouragement, and partly because there was something in his own soul that revolted at the littleness of the device. Lena was at home just at this time. Work was slack in the laundry, and Mary had not been well, so Lena stayed at home, glad enough to get an opportunity to torment Canute once more. She was washing in the side kitchen, singing loudly as she worked. Mary was on her knees, blacking the stove and scolding violently about the young man who was coming out from town that night. The young man had committed the fatal error of laughing at Mary's ceaseless babble and had never been forgiven. He's no good, and you will come to a bad end by running with him. I do not see why a daughter of mine should act so. I do not see why the Lord should visit such a punishment upon me as to give me such a daughter. There are plenty of good men you can marry. Lena tossed her head and answered curtly, I don't happen to want to marry any man right away, and so long as Dick dresses nice and has plenty of money to spend, there is no harm in my going with him. Money to spend, yes, and that is all he does with it, I'll be bound. You think it very fine now, but you will change your tune when you have been married five years and see your children running naked and your cupboard empty. Did Anne Hermanson come to any good by marrying a town man? I don't know anything about Anne Hermanson, but I know any of the laundry girls would have Dick quick enough if they could get him. Yes, and a nice lot of clothes hussies you are, too. Now there is Knutson, who has an eighty proved up, and fifty head of cattle, and, and hair that ain't been cut since he was a baby, and a big dirty beard, and he wears overalls on Sundays and drinks like a pig. Besides, he will keep. I can have all the fun I want, and when I am old and ugly like you, he can have me and take care of me. The Lord knows there ain't nobody else going to marry him. Knut drew his hand back from the latch as though it were red hot. He was not the kind of man to make a good eavesdropper, and he wished he had knocked sooner. He pulled himself together and struck the door like a battering ram. Mary jumped and opened it with a screech. God, Canute, you scared us! I thought it was Crazy Lou. He's been tearing around the neighborhood trying to convert folks. I am afraid as death of him. He ought to be sent off, I think. He's just as liable as not to kill us all, or burn the barn, or poison the dogs. He has been worrying even the poor minister to death, and he laid up with the rheumatism, too. Did you notice that he was too sick to preach last Sunday? But don't stand there in the cold. Come in. Jensen isn't here, but he just went over to Sorensen's for the mail. He won't be gone long. Walk right in the other room and sit down. Canute followed her, looking steadily in front of him and not noticing Lena as he passed her. But Lena's vanity would not allow him to pass unmolested. She took the wet sheet she was wringing out and cracked him across the face with it and ran giggling to the other side of the room. The blow stung his cheeks and the soapy water flew in his eyes and he involuntarily began rubbing them with his hands. Lena giggled with delight at his discomfiture and the wrath in Canute's face grew blacker than ever. A big man humiliated is vastly more undignified than a little one. He forgot the sting of his face in the bitter consciousness that he had made a fool of himself. He stumbled blindly into the living room, knocking his head against the door jamb because he forgot to stoop. He dropped into a chair behind the stove, thrusting his big feet back helplessly on either side of him. 
Oli was a long time in coming, and Canute sat there, still and silent, with his hands clenched over his knees, and the skin of his face seemed to have shriveled up into little wrinkles that trembled when he lowered his brows. His life had been one long lethargy of solitude and alcohol, but now he was awakening and it was as when the dumb, stagnant heat of summer breaks out into thunder. When Oli came staggering in, heavy with liquor, Canute rose at once. Jensen, he said quietly, I have come to see if you will let me marry your daughter today. Today? gasped Oli. Yes, I will not wait until tomorrow. I am tired of living alone. Oli braced his staggering knees against the bedstead and stammered eloquently. Do you think I will marry my daughter to a drunkard, a man who drinks raw alcohol, a man who sleeps with rattlesnakes? Get out of my house or I will kick you out for your impudence. And Oli began looking anxiously for his feet. Canute answered not a word, but he put on his hat and went out into the kitchen. He went up to Lena and said without looking at her, Get your things on and come with me. The tone of his voice startled her, and she said angrily, dropping the soap, Are you drunk? If you do not come with me, I will take you. You had better come, said Canute quietly. She lifted a sheet to strike him, but he caught her arm roughly and wrenched the sheet from her. He turned to the wall and took down a hood and shawl that hung there and began wrapping her up. Lena scratched and fought like a wild thing. Oli stood in the door cursing, and Mary howled and screeched at the top of her voice. As for Canute, he lifted the girl in his arms and went out of the house. She kicked and struggled, but the helpless wailing of Mary and Oli soon died away in the distance, and her face was held down tightly on Canute's shoulder so that she could not see whither he was taking her. She was conscious only of the north wind whistling in her ears, and of rapid, steady motion, and of a great breast that heaved beneath her in quick, irregular breaths. The harder she struggled, the tighter those iron arms that had held the heels of horses crushed about her until she felt as if they would crush the breath from her and lay still with fear. Canute was striding across the level fields at a pace at which man never went before, drawing the stinging north winds into his lungs in great gulps. He walked with his eyes half-closed and looking straight in front of him only lowering them when he bent his head to blow away the snowflakes that had settled on her hair. So it was that Canute took her to his home, even as his bearded barbarian ancestors took the fair, frivolous women of the South in their hairy arms and bore them down to their warships. For ever and anon the soul becomes weary of the conventions that are not of it, and with a single stroke shatters the civilized lies with which it is unable to cope, and the strong arm reaches out and takes by force what it cannot win by cunning. When Canute reached his shanty, he placed the girl upon a chair where she sat sobbing. He stayed only a few minutes. He filled the stove with wood and lit the lamp, drank a huge swallow of alcohol, and put the bottle in his pocket. He paused a moment, staring heavily at the weeping girl. Then he went off and locked the door, and disappeared in the gathering gloom of the night. Wrapped in flannels and soaked with turpentine, the little Norwegian preacher sat reading his Bible, when he heard a thundering knock at his door, and Canute entered, covered with snow and his beard frozen fast to his coat. "'Come in, Canute, you must be frozen,' said the little man, shoving a chair towards his visitor. Canute remained standing with his hat on and said quietly, "'I want you to come over to my house tonight to marry me to Lena Jensen.' "'Have you got a license, Canute?' No, I don't want a license. I want to be married. But I can't marry you without a license, man. It would not be legal. A dangerous light came in the big Norwegian's eye. I want you to come over to my house to marry me to Lena Jensen. No, I can't. It would kill an ox to go out in a storm like this, and my rheumatism is bad tonight. Then if you will not go, I must take you, said Canute with a sigh. He took down the preacher's bearskin coat and bade him put it on while he hitched up his buggy. He went out and closed the door softly after him. Presently he returned and found the frightened minister crouching before the fire with his coat lying beside him. Canute helped him put it on and gently wrapped his head in his big muffler. Then he picked him up and carried him out and placed him in his buggy. As he tucked the buffalo robes around him, he said, 
Your horse is old. He might flounder or lose his way in this storm. I will lead him. The minister took the reins feebly in his hands and sat shivering with the cold. Sometimes, when there was a lull in the wind, he could see the horse struggling through the snow with the man plodding steadily beside him. Again the blowing snow would hide them from him altogether, and he had no idea where they were or what direction they were going. He felt as though he were being whirled away in the heart of the storm, and he said all the prayers he knew. But at last the long four miles were over, and Canute set him down in the snow while he unlocked the door. He saw the bride sitting by the fire with her eyes red and swollen as though she had been weeping. Canute placed a huge chair for him and said roughly, Warm yourself. Lena began to cry and moan afresh, begging the minister to take her home. He looked helplessly at Canute. Canute said simply, If you are warm now, you can marry us. My daughter, do you take this step of your own free will? asked the minister in a trembling voice. No, sir, I don't, and it's disgraceful that he should force me into it. I won't marry him. "'Then, Canute, I cannot marry you,' said the minister, standing as straight as his rheumatic limbs would let him. "'Are you ready to marry us now, sir?' said Canute, laying one iron hand on his stooped shoulder. The little preacher was a good man, but, like most men of weak body, he was a coward, and had a horror of physical suffering, although he had known so much of it. So, with many qualms of conscience, he began to repeat the marriage service. Lena sat sullenly in her chair, staring at the fire. Canute stood beside her, listening with his head bent reverently and his hands folded on his breast. When the little man had prayed and said amen, Canute began bundling him up again. "'I will take you home now,' he said, as he carried him out and placed him in the buggy and started off with him through the fury of the storm, floundering among the snowdrifts that brought even the giant himself to his knees. After she was left alone, Lena ceased weeping. She was not of a particularly sensitive temperament, and had little pride beyond that of vanity. After the first bitter anger wore itself out, she felt nothing more than a healthy sense of humiliation and defeat. She had no inclination to run away, for she was married now, and in her eyes that was final and all rebellion was useless. She knew nothing about a license, but she knew that a preacher married folks. She consoled herself by thinking that she had always intended to marry Canute some day anyway. She grew tired of crying and looking into the fire, so she got up and began to look about her. She had heard queer tales about the inside of Canute's shanty, and her curiosity soon got the better of her. One of the first things she noticed was the new black suit of clothes hanging on the wall. She was dull, but it did not take a vain woman long to interpret anything so decidedly flattering, and she was pleased in spite of herself. As she looked through the cupboard, the general air of neglect and discomfort made her pity the man who lived there. "'Poor fellow! No wonder he wants to get married to get somebody to wash up his dishes. Batchin's pretty hard on a man.' "'It's easy to pity when one's vanity has been tickled.' She looked at the window sill and gave a little shudder and wondered if the man were crazy. Then she sat down again and sat a long time wondering what her dick and Oli would do. It's queer Dick didn't come right over after me. He surely came, for he would have left town before the storm began, and he might just as well come right on as go back. If he'd hurried, he would have gotten here before the preacher came. I suppose he was afraid to come, for he knew Knutson would pound him to jelly. The coward! Her eyes flashed angrily. The weary hours wore on, and Lena began to grow horribly lonesome. It was an uncanny night, and this was an uncanny place to be in. She could hear the coyotes howling hungrily a little way from the cabin, and more terrible still were all the unknown noises of the storm. She remembered the tales they told of the big log overhead, and she was afraid of those snaky things on the window sills. She remembered the man who had been killed in the draw, and she wondered what she would do if she saw Crazy Lou's white face glaring into the window. The rattling of the door became unbearable. She thought the latch must be loose, and she took the lamp to look at it. Then, for the first time, she saw the ugly brown snakeskins whose death rattle sounded every time the wind jarred the door. Canute! Canute! she screamed in terror. Outside the door she heard a heavy sound as of a big dog getting up and shaking himself. The door opened, 
and Canute stood before her, white as a snowdrift. "'What is it?' he asked kindly. I, "'I I am cold,' she faltered. He went out and got an armful of wood and a basket of cobs and filled the stove. Then he went out and lay in the snow before the door. Presently he heard her calling again. "'What is it?' he said, sitting up. "'I'm so lonesome. I'm afraid to stay in here all alone.' I will go over and get your mother. And he got up. She won't come. I'll bring her, said Canute grimly. No, no, I don't want her. She will scold all the time. Well, I will bring your father. She spoke again, and it seemed as though her mouth was close up to the keyhole. She spoke lower than he had ever heard her speak before, so low that he had to put his ear up to the lock to hear her. I don't want him to come either, Canute. I'd rather have you. For a moment she heard no noise at all, then something like a groan. With a cry of fear she opened the door and saw Canute stretched in the snow at her feet, his face in his hands, sobbing on the doorstep. End of On the Divide